And if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it with me to 1 Samuel chapter 31. Chapter 31. And by the way, I forgot to mention uh, in the announcements, this is worth mentioning, uh, all of our donations uh, are complete coming into the uh, relief efforts in the Ukraine. And uh, we were able to raise uh, over $6,200 uh, overall. So praise the Lord for that. Able to uh, send that to Samaritan's Purse and the Baptist World Alliance. So thanks everybody for their participation in that. Just wanted to mention that because although I wrote it on my hand, still forgot during the announcements. <laughs> For Samuel 31, verses 2 to 6, we are at the end of 1 Samuel, and it is a tragic but necessary end. When you're halfway through 1 Samuel, it just seems like this is the end that the book is moving toward, doesn't it? It just feels like eventually it's going to end with Saul dying in some kind of very dramatic um, yet tragic way. And we're going to look at the text and see Saul's death, and then we're going to connect it with the Bible's kind of big picture, kind of the big picture narrative, to see how Saul's death is a microcosm of a very important theme therein, and then how it's also a microcosm of our battle with sin and evil as well. So let's hear uh, from God's word today. 1 Samuel 31, verses 2 to 6. And then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. And then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse or torture me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. And so Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together the same day. It's the word of the Lord for us today. Samuel moves to the end with two battles. 1 Samuel 30, David fights the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 31, Saul fights the Philistines. And these two battles end way different. David defeats the Amalekites, gets his family back. Saul is killed by the Philistines. And the irony is that earlier on in 1 Samuel, Saul was called the one who will deliver us all from the Philistines. And yet here they strike him with an arrow so that he is sitting there bleeding out until he eventually just takes his own life. In verse 2, uh, we find his sons dying, three of them, leaving, I think, only Abner. That's the only son of Saul that is left. And I just want to mention something about the fact that Jonathan dies. Because Jonathan, he's what Billy Joel would probably call an innocent man. And, uh, and he's a good guy throughout the story. He's, uh, he's in David's back pocket, basically. And um, he's a good guy, and yet he dies here. This demonstrates for us that evil has all kinds of vexing effects later on, right? So Jonathan shouldn't die. He shouldn't be one of the ones that goes. But because he's Saul's son and Saul has behaved in the way that he does, he is part of the judgment on Saul. Jonathan dies. Um, and so furthermore, he's going to be out of David's way moving forward here because many people would probably want Jonathan to be the king since he would be the king incumbent. Jonathan would more than likely defer to David, but nevertheless, there would be division. And so God gets Jonathan out of the way. And with Jonathan being out of the way, now David is going to have to depend entirely on the Lord to get himself to the kingship instead of saying, well, at least I have Jonathan as my ace in the hole. And so it's very interesting that Jonathan dies. There are a lot of details uh, that are a part of that. In verse 3 here, we find the archers wound Saul, so he is sitting there bleeding out, about to die, but not dying quickly. And so in verse 4, this is a loaded verse. Everything that is operative happens in this verse right here, doesn't it? Saul demands the armor bearer, kills him. The armor bearer says no, so Saul falls on his sword. All of that happens in just this one verse right here in verse 4. And let's be clear. Saul rightly fears the torture of the Philistines, doesn't he? If you read a little bit later on in verse 8 and following when the Philistines get his corpse, they have a little bit of, little bit of fun with it, don't they? 
and I know that you're probably going to be looking at it now and not listening to what I'm saying, but, but they do that. We know that he rightly fears them because of that. He rightly fears them because there's ancient literature that tells us about tribes capturing opposite kings and then live flaying them, perhaps. So Saul rightly fears uh, what they're going to do to him. Nevertheless, right up until the end, he demands to do things on his own terms instead of waiting on the Lord and just trusting that the Lord is going to take care of him. That's the tragedy about this. It's not that Saul died. It's that right up until the end, he demands even to die on his own terms instead of trusting in the Lord and then questioning his own terms. And so what does he do? He looks at his miserable life that's been made miserable, not just because of what he's done, but because the Israelites demanded a king. He wasn't qualified, but then he continued to harden his heart after that. And then he ends it all by taking his own life and falling on his sword. Let's be very clear here. This is not heroic on Saul's part. And I want to say this because some of the commentators treat this like it's heroic on his part. And I also want to be clear about this because I, I see in culture today this almost romanticizing of suicide. And it should not be romanticized. And sometimes conservative Christians, we respond to it by saying that suicide is, is selfish. While that, while that is one way you can approach it, I wouldn't call suicide selfish. I would call it proud. Because what's happening when a person takes their own life is they're saying God cannot have good purposes for me in my pain, and God is not going to bring me, bring me out of this eventually. What, it, what is it? It's pride. It's saying that all I can see is my pain right now, and that must be all that there is. And you might say, well, pastor, that's a little bit cold-hearted. Maybe, but I think it's true. I think it's true. And I say this as a person who has, who has had times in my past where I even had suicidal thoughts in my early 20s. Been there. Many of us, I know, have been there as well because many of us have dealt with mental health struggles. We get it. Nevertheless, it's pride that says that there's no way that God can bring me out of this. That's my criticism of Saul here. It's his pride. All the way up until the end, he demands to do things on his own terms. All the way up until the end, he's a rebel. And so in verse 5, uh, his armor bearer, we know what happens there. And then in verse 6, that says that Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. That word together is very important in that verse. The point is that right here at the very end, God decided to end this regime all at once. They all died together. They were all together uh, in some ways, and so God ended it uh, all at once purposefully. Now, you might look at this, and one thought that you might have is, by the end of 1 Samuel, is it the case that the Philistines had defeated Israel? Is it the case that the Philistine gods had won? Because you might remember earlier in the story that really funny uh, situation that Bob and Regina and I were joking about last Sunday night where, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant is placed in the Philistine room with Dagon. When they come back the next day, Dagon has fallen over and his head has fallen off and his hands have fallen off. It's actually a pretty funny story. There's, there are all kinds of funny things in the Bible like that. One of these days, maybe I'll preach on how humorous the Bible actually is. Um, but we might look at this and we might think that with Israel defeated here, with the king dead and all of that, the Philistines must have won. You just have to be patient. Because by the time you get into 2 Samuel, David is not only going to defeat the Philistines decisively, he's going to defeat them spectacularly. And it's going to be remarkable. You just have to be patient. Speaking of 2 Samuel, once you get into 2 Samuel, and you don't have to turn there, but... What you would notice if you were to start reading the first chapter of 2 Samuel is that as David is grieving the death of Saul and Jonathan, he pens a poem. And it's a poem that starts off 2 Samuel very similar to a poem starting off 1 Samuel. Anybody remember who wrote that poem that started off 1 Samuel? It was Hannah, right? Hannah, the mother of Samuel, she writes this incredible poem, and uh, there's a point to it that is going to set up all of 1st and 2nd Samuel. There's another poem that David writes at the beginning of 2nd Samuel. And by the way, there are two poems that end 2nd Samuel too. And my point in telling you all this is because 1st and 2nd Samuel are framed by four poems. Four poems that are put throughout the story so that you read the history and then you read the poems and it tells you what's going on from God's perspective. 
And so let me just kind of give you a big picture of these poems. When Hannah writes her poem in 1 Samuel 2, she talks about and she discusses the fact that God is going to establish an eternal kingdom. That's what Hannah says. God will establish a kingdom. So that sets up what 1 and 2 Samuel are all about, God establishing the kingdom. When David grieves the loss of uh, Saul and Jonathan, he is going to make the point in 2 Samuel 1 that the mighty have fallen and therefore God is going to defeat all of his enemies. That's what that second poem is about. When you get to the end of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, it is promised that David's throne is going to be established for forever, thus answering the question, well, who's going to have this kingdom? When Hannah writes about this eternal kingdom, who's going to have this kingdom? The promise is that it's going to be David's family, David's lineage. And then finally, finally, when you get to 2 Samuel 23, the fourth and final poem, um, this kingdom of David is cast in terms of God's everlasting covenant, thereby making the point that the promise of David to have an eternal kingdom is fulfilling the promise to Abraham that was an everlasting covenantal promise. So, so okay, pastor, that's a lot of cool information. What does this mean? It means this. These four poems... God's going to establish a kingdom. God's going to defeat his enemies. The kingdom is going to come through David's lineage. And this is going to fulfill the covenantal promise to Abraham going all the way back earlier on in the Old Testament. In many ways, 1 and 2 Samuel summarizes and holds together the entire Bible, doesn't it? At least these poems summarize the Bible and really ties together the entire narrative. This shows us, therefore, that what the Old Testament is is the background narrative of the seed of the woman coming to defeat evil through David's lineage and channeled through, I'm sorry, through Abraham's lineage and channeled through David's son's kingdom. And so the Old Testament ends by asking, okay, David's kingdom is never going to go away. It's never going to die. Who is this king? That's where the Old Testament ends. Who is this king that we're waiting for? Because he's fulfilling the promises, he's going to defeat evil, he's going to have an eternal kingdom. Who is it? And that's where the New Testament comes in, and it says it's Jesus. He's the son of David. He's the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of Adam. It ties him back to Adam. He's the son of David who's going to establish the everlasting kingdom. And so I would say this. You don't have to understand the Old Testament in order to believe in Jesus. I think that a person can come to faith in Christ without understanding the Old Testament. But if you want to glory in Christ, if you want to appreciate Jesus, dare I say, if you want to enjoy Jesus, you've got to understand the background. You've got to understand the Old Testament. In a similar way that when you have a... Um, when you meet a Christian acquaintance who just has uh, something of a, a powerful uh, sort of contagious faith and they stir your soul for the Lord and you just enjoy this person so much and then you hear their testimony and it just enriches it that much more. In a similar way, you can see the glory of Christ in the Gospels of the New Testament, can't you? But it's when you see who he is with the Old Testament leading to him that you glory in him. You see his glory. You enjoy him so much. So there was a purpose to that whole story. God has made promises. God has fulfilled promises. It is, it is compelling, this Christ-centered view of reality that the Bible gives us. And I think that First and Second Samuel are very important in tying all of that together. Therefore, Saul's death, because of all of this, preaches to us. We might even say that Saul's blood on the ground there when he's bleeding out is crying out to us, preaching a message to us because the New Testament says these things are written for us, for our faith. And it's crying out to us about God's redeeming purposes. What is it saying? It's saying this, God allows evil to continue for the sake of his own sanctifying purposes until the right time. Let me say that again. God allows evil to continue for the sake of his own sanctifying purposes until the right time. And when that right time comes, evil is going to be begging for its release. Just like Saul was begging here to die. 
Read Revelation 9, right? You can read in Revelation 9, all of those who are enemies of God are begging for the mountains to fall on them, right? Very similar to Saul right here. And yet God allows evil to continue on, even in the present day, because he has sanctifying purposes. So trust him. While evil continues, it's not that he's not in control. It's that he is in control, and he's using all of these things for his good purposes, and you're going to be the beneficiary of these things. So, that being said, let's uh, flesh that out a little bit more. At the end of 1 Samuel here, as we finish this series, this seemed to take a long time, but I don't think it took that long. It was just a couple years off and on in 1 Samuel. At the end of 1 Samuel, let's have kind of three summary points here uh, that I want to use uh, the remainder of my time with you to go through. One of them is this. God's anointed king is already reigning. God's anointed king is already reigning. Even though it's not until 1 Samuel 31 that Saul is dead, David's already the king, isn't he? God's already promised that he's going to be the king. Look who God is with, not Saul. Saul can't hear God. David can hear God. Saul's not safe. David is safe. David's already reigning. He's already the king at that point. But again, God is allowing Saul to continue on because he's sanctifying three groups. First, he's sanctifying David because he's growing David. He's building his patience. He's showing himself as what Ed Welch calls the God of the 11th hour. So he's sanctifying David. He's also sanctifying Israel by uh, teaching them the hard lesson. Look, this is the king that you wanted with Saul and look at where it's getting you. So he's teaching them hard lessons. But might I also add that he's sanctifying us as well. Because this history that's happening is then going to be given to us as examples of God's faithfulness. So God has all these sanctifying purposes for the time, allowing uh, Saul to continue on, even though David is already the king. In a similar way, we can say that Christ is the king even now as well. He's the king, even though we don't see him reigning. That's Hebrews 2, isn't it? We don't see Jesus reigning right now. It's not like he's sitting in Jerusalem on a throne and we can go see him right now. We don't see him reigning, but he's the king. And he demands that we believe that he's the king regardless of what the world says. It doesn't matter what people say. It also doesn't matter how many people believe in him. If every single person were to forsake their Christian faith in the world... It, it, he would still be the king, wouldn't he? Because he doesn't need us in order to reign. By virtue of the fact that he rose from the dead, that proves that he's the eternal son of God. So he is the king. He's reigning even now. And if you're a Christian, you are not on the wrong side of history. You believe the truth. And one day, every eye is going to see this Lord who is indeed the king. And when you see him, you're not going to be surprised because you will have already been feasting on him with the eyes of your hearts. And so God's anointed king is already reigning, and I just want you to know that your faith in him is not just because it's comfortable for you. It's because the Spirit of God continually brings you back to him so that you can't get away from him because he's really the king. Every fiber of your being, let's be honest with ourselves, every fiber of your being tries to go away from Jesus, doesn't it? Don't you find within yourself the same principle that Paul described in Romans 7, where you can't submit to the law of God even though you think that it's good, you can't walk with him even though you know that it's good? Again, I've told you before, I fight with every fiber of my being to be obedient to the Bible. If, if I could run away... I would, but the Lord says that he's protecting me because he's the king. And one day every eye is going to see, and you're going to see him as well, and you're not going to be surprised because you were already living with him as it is. God's anointed king is already reigning. That's one point that we see here at the end of 1 Samuel. Secondly, God's enemies will all be defeated. It's only a matter of time, isn't it? Saul's days here at the end of 1 Samuel, they're already numbered. His days are already numbered. And when the perfect time came, what happens? He's out of there. And yet, like I've said, he's an instrument in the Redeemer's hand, isn't he? He might be a vessel of wrath instead of a vessel of mercy, 
Romans 9, right? But nevertheless, he's an instrument in the Redeemer's hand, serving God's good purposes, as we've already talked about. Now today, let's, uh, let's connect this to today. There are several enemies who were allowed to continue on, whom Jesus has already overcome. So the three primary enemies that Christians face, Satan, sin, and the world, or Satan, the flesh, and the world. All of these enemies, even though Jesus has already overcome them, are allowed to continue on again because they're serving God's purposes. God could destroy Satan and throw him into the lake of fire even now, but he chooses not to because Satan's activity produces a sanctifying struggle in our lives that is necessary. You read 1 Peter 5, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist him firm in the faith, and in time the Lord will stand you back up and strengthen you. Is that not implying that the devil's prowling around is not outside of the Lord's control? Isn't that exactly what Peter's saying? He's prowling, resist him, the Lord will stand you up in time. That means that he only prowls the enemy as much as the Lord allows him to. Once you've gotten everything that you need to have gotten from his activity. It's amazingly um, comforting to know that Satan can only do to me what the Lord allows him to do to me. And the, the Lord that we talk about is the Lord who loves us and cares for us. So he could destroy Satan entirely, but he chooses not to because he produces a sanctifying struggle. Another enemy is sin in the flesh. Again, he lets that continue. He lets it continue. He lets you struggle with sin throughout the rest of your life so that he will exalt his grace in your life and you'll be thankful that he's a merciful and gracious God. Furthermore, he lets you struggle with sin so that you will actually be light in the world because you're told to be the light of the world, aren't you? That's what Jesus says. And if you were perfect you would probably just totally take yourself out of the world entirely and go off into a monastery or something like that where you could be perfect with other perfect people. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to make you similar to the world in many ways, yet you're not of the world, and that is going to make you light in the world. That's why the struggle with sin continues on. He's got good purposes. But again, a third enemy that the Lord will eventually defeat and I want to be careful with this one. I want to, this is a little more nuanced, is the world. The world. The reason why he allows the world in its present form to continue is because he cares for the world, he loves the world, and he has good purposes for it that he's not going to forsake. We might even say he allows the world to continue on in its present form so that we will be comfortable in it so that when it's made new, we will just be that much more thankful and consider it to be that much more glorious because we remember what it was like before and we experienced what it was like before. We might think, and I'm kind of speaking in kind of biblical generalities here and, um, you know, teaching, you know, what the scripture says, but practically, what are we talking about? I think I mentioned it was either last week or the week before that a lot of the enemies that are at work, especially in the world today, are ideological enemies, ideological idols, uh, I think is what I talked about last week. And there are a lot of them, a lot of ideologies that are, that are out there right now that, quite frankly, are wreaking havoc throughout the church, um, among believers, you know, critical theory, things like this. They claim to be about justice, but they're not. They're not about justice. They're about power. There are other theories, LGBTQ theories, things like this, um, again, that are not about justice, but are about power. And I have heard, well, let me just, let me say this. What they are, are revolutionary ideologies. They want revolution. And what they want is a revolution against the Christian past. That's what they want. They don't want Christ to be in authority anymore. And I've heard enough people literally and explicitly saying that we are trying to indoctrinate children that I can't, I can't not call it a conspiracy. 
you know, you might see a, a foil hat on my head now when I say that. But let's be honest, every single one of us believes in some kind of conspiracies going on out there. I've heard enough people say the same things on videos, uh, on podcasts, whatever, that it's very, very clear that there is some kind of an effort out there to undermine the Lord and the Lord's order in his world. It's revolution. That's what they want. And I don't want to like plug my blog post. Clearly, I've never wanted to do that because I'm pretty sure seven people in the world read it, four of which are my family members. Um, but I did just write on this the other day. Just wrote on this the other day and, uh, and had, some, uh, had some engagement with a guy's tweet thread where he's just... He's talking about how these ideologies are all related and all a part of a tapestry that is being presented to try to change the world. And it's not for the sake, again, I'm not convinced that it's for the sake of justice, it's for the sake of power. Christians should be the first people on the front lines when there's real injustice happening, shouldn't we? Standing up and saying, that's wrong. And let's also be clear about sexuality and gender struggles and things like that. I think Romans 1 makes very clear that in a fallen world, there are going to be struggles with that. But people are trying to normalize all of these things for the sake of rebellion. Just like Saul, and just like the enemies of God all through time. And we consider, we consider the reality of abortion being the, being the probably the greatest genocide maybe in world history, and we cry about these things, weep about the evil of these things, and we might wonder, Lord, why do you allow these things to persist? And it's because he's separating the sheep from the goats even now. You might say, well, pastor, that only happens at the end. Matthew 25, Jesus talked about that. Well, Peter in 1 Peter 4, it's time for judgment to begin where? Somebody help me out. At the household of God, right? And so a lot of people are going after these ideologies because they feel guilty. And because they might actually be more listening to the world than they are listening to the shepherd. And so what the Lord is doing is he's drawing a hard line between those who are listening to the world and those who are listening to the shepherd. And I got to be honest, it's actually a little bit relieving, isn't it? Because I think for a long time, at least the evangelical culture that I grew up in, it was very easy to identify as a Christian without actually living as a new creation. Today, it's becoming more and more difficult. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to know how hard it's going to be. Um, probably, probably public opinion of evangelical Christians is lower than it's maybe ever been in this country. I don't know. There's, I don't know if there's any way to quantify that. I'm not sure if there is. But just get on social media and, oh my goodness, if you represent a traditional Christian perspective on any social issue, um, you know, there's, it can just get ugly. I've told you about this before. And so, again, it's going to be difficult but it should be somewhat relieving to us that our Lord, still in the present day, has purposes for all of this. He knows what he's doing, and he's going to defeat his enemies in the end. And finally, thirdly, um, and I've already, been, I've already implied this, but I just want to make the point explicit. So we know that God's anointed king is already reigning. We know that his enemies will be defeated. And we also know, thirdly and finally, that God's purposes for allowing evil are good. Whereas Satan prowls around, like, I'm sorry, Saul is prowling around, um, trying to hunt David, trying to destroy David, and yet it drives David deeper with the Lord than he ever would have been before, such that David is going to find it much more difficult to run away from the Lord, having been delivered so many times. So today, again, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, but it's driving us closer to the Lord. Trial in the present day is the soil in which your roots in Jesus go deeper. You can't grow in the Lord unless you go through trial. It's that simple. And you might say, well, pastor, the trial I'm going through right now, I don't think I need it. 
I don't need this. I don't need that. I would say, maybe you do, actually. Just think. Maybe you do. 1 Peter 1, 6, I think it is. He says, right now, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. If necessary, that means that a lot of our trials we receive because we actually do need them. We just, we just don't see it. We don't see how we need them. That's okay. You don't have to see it. God does. God knows. And there are a lot of unavoidable trials that we might go through. You know, we have a lot of people with a lot of health scares. We got people who struggle with cancer, other kinds of health problems, things that seem to be unavoidable, things that we have a hard time saying that they just are directly sent by God to us, although I think we need to have a bigger theology that allows for that kind of thing. What I would say is this. If a person's dealing with an unavoidable trial, especially a health one that can be just so crushing and devastating that, they, that they're left not knowing what to say, I would say this. In a fallen world, the Scripture tells us that there's a lot that's going to happen to us that is unexplainable. You read the book of Job, Job goes through such incredible suffering. I don't know if Job wrote Job. I tend to think not. But let's just say that he didn't, because I tend to think that he didn't, therefore it must be true. Um, but I don't think Job wrote it. If he didn't, Job never got an explanation for why he went through what he went through. Never got an explanation. God never told him why. He just said, I'm God, you're not. Never got an explanation. And if you turn to Ecclesiastes... The word in some translations is vanity of vanities, meaningless in some translations, but the word in Hebrew, it's the word hevel, which means vapor. And it's making the point that so much of life is like vapor. You can see it, you can be blinded by it, but if you try to grab it, you can't get it in your hands. I'm kind of, somebody's, uh, there's an exorcism happening in the back room there. <laughs> point is, Point is, there's just so there's so much that's that's not going to be explainable uh, in this life, and, and so whereas we feel the need to have explanations and to know why certain things happen, at some point we have to just take a step back and say, I don't know, but God does, and He's good. The giving God is good. He's a shepherd. He cares for me. There will be some trials that he'll show me the reason for in this life. There will be some trials that I'm never going to understand. But he knows, and he's good to me. One day, again, just like Saul, all of God's enemies are going to be begging for death. Again, Revelation talks about this very, very clearly. It's very similar to Saul. And you and I are going to be there just simply thankful for his mercy over our lives in his love for us. I was thinking about this uh, yesterday. I'm sitting in my office just reflecting on the scripture in Revelation that says that he will wipe away their tears from their eyes. I tend to think that we usually interpret that figuratively um, and that the tears are the tears that we've cried throughout our lives. And so it's like one day he's going to soothe our hurt such that we're going to forget about the tears. I wonder, though, if the verse is meant to be understood literally. Because when we go to him one day, we're going to be so relieved, we're going to be so happy, and we're going to be so, it's going to be so warm to know, oh, we believed the truth all along. And our Lord, who we believed in, really did care for us, really did shepherd us, really did carry us. And the only response is going to be that we're going to weep. And then our Lord's going to wipe our tears away from us. And we're just going to enjoy him for forever. Saul, all throughout the second part of 1 Samuel, he's insane. And yet David, at various points, could turn Saul's heart, couldn't he? He could play music, and Saul would calm down. He could speak to Saul, and Saul would calm down. If David had that much power over another mere man, how much more his son, Jesus, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords? And my point, my point in saying that is this. 
Another reason why evil is allowed to continue and why the enemies of God are allowed to continue in this world is because very often our Lord will pluck a brand out of that fire and save them. Again, um, um, well, I was telling, I was going to do a little bit more reading this past week, but I didn't, I didn't have time for it. But you've maybe heard the name uh, Abby Johnson, uh, who is a... Uh, who was a former abortion worker who, uh, based on Christian conviction, was pulled out of that world, and now she's an activist for life, um, for the sanctity of human life. Other examples, I've talked before about Rosaria Butterfield, a former um, lesbian feminist professor who was anti-Christ until she was befriended by a Christian pastor, and over the course of several years, uh, came to faith. And these are just two examples because I wrote them down on my little notes here. But they're just example after example after example of people who were taken in by the zeitgeist of the age who the Lord plucks out of the fire. That's part of why he allows evil to continue is so that there's a fire to pluck brands out of so that he can be shown as the God of mercy and the God of grace. And yet that being said, in light of what we see here with Saul's death, there is coming a time when God's judgment is going to come. And he calls on us and demands of us that in the present day, we would number our days to gain a heart of wisdom and let the people of God hear what the Lord has for his church. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for your great mercy, your great patience, your great kindness toward people such as us. Not only the fact that we exist, therefore you have graciously decided to create us, and not only have you provided for us in this world so that we have what we need, sometimes pickings are slim, sometimes things are more abundant, but if we're here, it's because the Lord has sustained us. But furthermore, when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, you made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, we have been saved through faith. So we thank you for that. And our prayer, O oh Lord, is that we would, as it seems like David learned, be patient with the presence of evil in our day, knowing that you have good purposes for allowing it to continue. And in the end, we'll see it, and we'll weep that we made it, and you'll wipe away our tears, as you've promised. Shepherd us, O Lord, we pray, in Christ's righteous name, amen.